For more physics related videos, please subscribe. In this video, we're going to be answering the question Can we see past the horizon? This video directly follows from the previous video in which I derived the distance to the horizon. So I would suggest watching that video first if you haven't already. I rated the physics level in this video as intermediate. Let's start off by briefly reviewing how we derived the distance to the horizon. If this is the Earth, and you're standing on the Earth with a height h, when you look at the horizon, the horizon is the point where your line of sight is tangential to the surface of the Earth. We then use this point along with the center of the Earth to create a right triangle with one leg of length r, where capital R is the radius of the Earth, and the hypotenuse has a length capital R plus h, the height of the person. We then found that the angle that is subtended around the surface of the Earth by this right triangle is equal to the dip angle of our line of sight below the horizontal. The distance of the horizon is this arc length created by this angle phi. And by the definition of an angle, this is equal to the radius of the Earth times phi. And we found that this was approximately equal to the square root of 2 times the radius of the Earth times the height of the observer. But it turns out there is a slight inaccuracy with this method. You see, this method implicitly assumes that light will travel from the horizon to your eye in a straight line. But actually, light doesn't travel in straight lines. Light travels according to Fermat's principle, which says that it will take the path of least time. And a straight line is the path of least distance. So the two are not necessarily the same. In the case of the Earth, it's surrounded by an atmosphere, and the density of the atmosphere decreases with elevation. This results in the speed of light being faster at higher elevations. So in order to minimize time, light would like to travel at higher elevations. And this straight line is not the path of least time because too much of the path is at lower elevation where light is not traveling as fast. However, if light were to go too far out of its way, say way up here at very high elevation, even though it will be able to travel faster, it will have gone too far out of its way and the extra speed won't compensate for the extra distance and so the time will start to increase again. This is basically like if you're traveling somewhere and you want to get there as fast as possible. The most direct path might be along surface streets, but the speed limit is slow there. So instead, it's faster to go out of your way, hop on the highway where you can go faster, and even though you've traveled a larger distance, you're going to get there in a shorter amount of time. But if the highway is too far away, the benefit of traveling faster doesn't compensate for the extra distance you have to travel to get to and from the highway. So, light will not travel in a straight line to our eye, but instead along a special curved path that minimizes time. First thing to notice here, the point we labeled as the horizon is not the actual horizon because light is not traveling tangential to the surface of the Earth at this point. Instead, the point where light travels tangential to the surface of the Earth will be further along the Earth's surface. And that will be the true horizon. So the angle phi that we took to be the angle to the horizon is actually too small, and we need to correct with an extra angle, which I'm going to call delta phi. So because of this bending of light, light will actually bend around the surface of the Earth, and we'll be able to see past the point we initially thought was the horizon. So now, the total distance to the horizon is actually going to be r times this larger angle, phi plus delta phi. Well, we already know what r times phi is, so all that's left is to solve for delta phi. Another thing to notice here is that the dip angle below the horizontal, when we're looking at the horizon, is not actually phi, but a slightly shallower angle, which I'm going to call alpha. In a previous video, titled Albedoni vs. Fermat, I showed that this same bending of light resulted in an error in Albedoni's method for measuring the radius of the Earth. And in that video, using an approximation for the index of refraction, I actually derived an expression for tangent squared of alpha. So here, the index of refraction is a function of the radial position, which is the distance from the center of the Earth. If you don't know, the speed of light in a medium is the speed of light in a vacuum divided by the index of refraction. So as we did in Albedoni versus Fermat, 
we're going to use this expression for the index of refraction, which says that it's equal to the index of refraction at the surface of the Earth times this factor 1 minus A times delta R, where A is a number that depends on the properties of the atmosphere, and delta R is the distance above the surface of the Earth. In Albedoni versus Fermat, I also derive an expression for the derivative, or more specifically, the derivative squared of r as a function of theta. So remember, little r is the radial position at some point along this trajectory, and this angle theta is the angular position of that point. This is not the same as phi. Phi is one specific angle, as is delta phi. Theta is a variable that varies from zero to phi plus delta phi in our example. So if you don't know what a derivative is, dr d theta, this tells you the angle or the direction that the tangent line points at a given point along this trajectory. So in this video, we're gonna need to make use of both of these results. Now, if you actually wanted an exact solution for the shape of this curve, you could take the square root of this expression to just get dr d theta instead of dr d theta squared and integrate it. But integrating the square root of this right-hand side is not an easy task. In fact, I don't know how to do it. If somebody knows how to integrate this, please let me know in the comments. So we're instead going to approximate this curve. And we can do this because we expect the correction to the straight line path to be very small. So that means that A times delta R is small, and consequently delta phi is going to be small, as is the difference between phi and alpha. So one way we can do this is to apply perturbation theory. And that's a perfectly valid method, but it turns out in this problem it's not so straightforward to do. It can be done, but it's long and tedious. So we're going to do it an easier way. We know that if we ignore the effects of this factor A, meaning we ignore the effects of the bending of light through the atmosphere, the answer should be this straight line path. Now, if we include the effect of the atmosphere, it's going to be a small correction. Well, a small correction to a straight line should make this a parabola, because the next degree up in polynomial from a straight line is a parabolic equation. So we're going to assume that this trajectory is parabolic. So let's see what that gives us. First, let's redraw our diagram. Now, let's take a random point along this trajectory. This point is going to have a vertical position, which I'm going to call y, and a horizontal position, which I'm going to call x. And this makes a right triangle. The straight line trajectory has a linear equation. Now we have a parabolic trajectory, so we're going to have a parabolic equation of y as a function of x. We could solve this directly in terms of x and y, but because we're going around a circle, it's actually a little easier to solve this in polar coordinates. So instead of using positions x and y, I'm going to use the radial position and an angular position, which I'm calling theta and little r. So looking at this right triangle, y is the adjacent side to this angle theta. So recalling Chief Sokotoa from your intro trigonometry class, if y is the adjacent side and r is the hypotenuse, this means that y is equal to r times cosine theta. And since x is the opposite side, we have that x equals r sine theta. Now we can plug these values in to this equation where we have x and y. And this gives the following. Now to simplify this a little bit, we're going to use a small angle approximation. Because we know that we can't actually see that far along the surface of the Earth. So that means that phi is a small angle. And delta phi is a small correction to phi, at least we expect it to be. So phi plus delta phi is going to be small. And so theta, which is always going to be less than that value, is also going to be small everywhere. So given that theta is small, we can approximate sine theta to be approximately theta, and cosine theta to be approximately 1 minus theta squared over 2. So now let's make that substitution into our parabolic equation. Next, we also need information about the tangent line at each point along this curve meaning we need information about the derivative of r with respect to theta. So let's take a derivative of both sides of this equation with respect to theta, and I'm going to use the notation that r dot is equal to dr d theta. Taking this derivative leads to the following expression. 
just to quickly overview how I got this. On this left hand side, we have an R times some other factor which depends on theta. So we have to use product rule for derivatives, which says that we take the derivative of R while holding this factor constant. Remember that the derivative of R is R dot. And then we hold R constant and take the derivative of this factor. Well, 1 is a constant, so that its derivative is 0. And the derivative of negative theta squared over 2 is negative theta. So here we have times negative theta. On the right hand side of the equation, we're going to have to use product rule here, because we have an R squared times a theta squared, as well as here, because we have an R times theta. So these first two terms result from doing the product rule of this term. And then the last two terms result from doing the product rule of this term that's proportional to b. And then c is a constant, so its derivative is 0. Now we have to match boundary conditions for these two equations, meaning we have to match the conditions at this point and this point, both position and derivative. So first boundary condition, if theta equals 0, the radial position has to be r plus h, because that's what this leg of the triangle is, or this hypotenuse of the triangle is. The next condition is that the derivative of r at theta equals 0 has to equal the position, which is r plus h, times tangent of alpha, and it's negative because we're looking down. The third condition is that at the horizon, theta equals phi plus delta phi, and the radial position is the radius of the Earth, capital R. And finally, we have that the derivative of r at the horizon is equal to zero, because at this point, the trajectory is tangential to the surface of the Earth, and the Earth is a sphere. If you're finding this video interesting so far, please like and subscribe, and maybe help me out by sharing it with a few friends. So now we have four equations and four unknowns, because we don't know A, we don't know B, we don't know C, and we don't know delta phi. So four equations, four unknown, this is a solvable system of equations. All we have to do is plug in to these four boundary conditions. Before we do that, we need to know what h is in terms of phi or vice versa. So looking at this original white triangle, we can see that the hypotenuse has length capital R plus h, and the adjacent side is capital R. So hypotenuse over adjacent is 1 over cosine or secant phi. And that's going to be r plus h divided by r, which is equal to 1 plus h over r. Since phi is a small angle, secant phi is approximately equal to 1 plus phi squared over 2. Now we can solve for h to find that it's approximately capital R over 2 times phi squared. All right, now we're ready to plug into our four boundary conditions. Let's first write our two equations for our parabolic path. And the first boundary condition says that r of 0 is equal to capital R plus h. And remember what h is in terms of phi. So this means that in this equation, everywhere we have theta, we plug in 0. And everywhere we have little r, we plug in capital R plus h. So we have capital R plus h, which is equal to capital R times 1 plus phi squared over 2, is equal to c. Because this term has a phi in it. And since phi is 0, that whole term is 0, as is this one. And there's a phi squared here, and that's zero as well. So we found that c is equal to capital R times 1 plus phi squared over 2. Next boundary condition, we have that r dot at theta equals zero is equal to negative r plus h times tangent of alpha. Now we're plugging in to this equation. Everywhere we have r dot, we have to plug in this expression. And everywhere we have theta, we plug in zero. And everywhere we have r, we plug in capital R plus H. Again, this term is zero, this term is zero, this term is zero, this term is zero, and this term is zero. So the only one that survives on the right hand side is B times R, and on the left hand side is just R dot. We have an R plus H on both sides, so they can cancel, giving us that B is equal to negative tangent of alpha. And recall, we have this expression for tangent squared of alpha, which we're going to have to simplify a little bit. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to expand this squared term in the parentheses. Remember what we're doing here. We're just looking for a first order correction to the straight line trajectory. And our correction is determined by A. So 
first order correction will go as a to the first power. This term goes as a squared, so that's a second order correction. So we can ignore it. Another way to think about this is a is small, so a squared is really small. So ignoring it doesn't really make much of a difference. Now I'm going to rewrite this, isolating our correction term. Now a times h is small, and h over r is also very small because it's the height of a person divided by the radius of the Earth. Since this term is small, we can safely ignore this h over r term and just take this term in the parentheses to be 1. Now let's go back to the diagram for a second. If a is 0, then our solution is going to be this straight line trajectory. And in that case, alpha will equal phi. So tangent of alpha will equal tangent of phi. So here we have tangent squared alpha. If this term is 0, then all we're left with are these two terms, and that's got to equal tangent squared of phi. And if you want to double check this, you can go back to the white triangle, and you'll see that in fact that is the case. So now I'm going to rewrite this with tangent squared phi, which I'm going to pull out in front of everything. So this term is tangent squared phi. I've pulled it out, so I just have a 1. Then I'm pulling out tangent squared phi from this term, which means I'm going to divide by tangent squared phi, which is the same as multiplying by cotangent squared phi. Now we don't want tangent squared of alpha. We want tangent of alpha. So let's take a square root. And remember, this term is small. And if you have something of the form 1 plus x to the n, and x is small, that is approximately equal to 1 plus n times x. This identity here is very useful and pops up in physics all the time, so you should be familiar with it. So in our case, this is x, and our exponent n is 1 half, since this is a square root. So multiplying this term by 1 half, we'll just get rid of this 2. So now we're left with tangent alpha equals this expression. Now remember, we're making a small angle approximation, and tangent phi for a small angle is approximately phi, and this is cotangent phi squared, which is 1 over tangent phi squared, so that's going to be 1 over phi squared, and remember that we know what h is in terms of phi. So now let's plug all that in, and notice here we have a phi squared divided by a phi squared, so those will cancel, and what we want, remember, is b, which is negative tangent of alpha, so we get that b equals negative phi times this expression 1 plus a times capital R over 2. And that covers the second boundary condition. Now, let's erase all of this and rewrite the two results from our two boundary conditions. The third boundary condition says that r at the horizon is equal to the radius of the Earth, and the angle is going to be phi plus delta phi. So, in this equation, everywhere we see little r, we plug in capital R, and everywhere we see theta, we plug in phi plus delta phi. And remember, now we know what b and c are. So this gives us this fairly long expression. But don't worry, it's going to simplify quite a bit. First off, we can divide every term by r. Next, let's take a look at this term. This is the term that makes our equation a parabola meaning this is the correction term to the straight line path. So we know that A, capital A, has to be small because it's our correction term. Well, delta phi is also a correction term, so it's also small. So since capital A is small, we don't need to keep this delta phi term because that'll be a higher order correction. So we can just ignore that piece. Now I'm going to expand out all of the parentheses, and let's see what cancels. First off, we have a 1 on both sides. Then we have, on the left-hand side, negative phi squared over 2, and on the right-hand side we have negative phi squared plus phi squared over 2, which is equal to negative phi squared over 2. So these three terms cancel. Then we have a negative phi times delta phi on both sides. And finally, this term is delta phi squared. Remember, delta phi is a small correction, so delta phi squared is again a higher-order term, so we can ignore it. And this term has a delta phi times a. So a is a correction, as is delta phi. So this term is a second order correction, so we can ignore it as well. So all that we have left is this term and this term. Solving for capital A, we find that it's equal to negative little a over 2. 
almost there, one more boundary condition, which says that the trajectory travels tangential to the surface of the Earth at the horizon. So this means that r dot at theta equals phi plus delta phi is equal to zero. And remember that at this angle, r is also equal to capital R. So now we plug that in to this term. Everywhere we see r dot, we plug in zero. Everywhere we see theta, we plug in phi plus delta phi. And everywhere we see r, we plug in capital R. So this gives us the following expression. Again, here we have a term that's proportional to little a, so that's already a correction, so we can ignore this delta phi, because that again will be a second order correction. We also can divide out a factor of r from every term. So now I'm going to expand out all of the parentheses. We have a negative phi on both sides of the equation. And these two terms are like terms. This is negative a times r times phi, and this is positive 1 half a times r times phi. And on the left-hand side, we just have negative delta phi. So we find that delta phi is equal to little a times the radius of the Earth over 2 times phi. And we're basically done. This is what we were looking for. So let's go back to our equation for the distance of the horizon and plug that in. First thing, let's erase some of this stuff. And we can now write that the distance of the horizon is capital R times phi times 1 plus little a times capital R over 2. Now we got to plug in some values. For the Earth's atmosphere, little a is about 2 times 10 to the negative 5 inverse kilometers, and the average radius of the Earth is about 6,400 kilometers. Plugging in these numbers gives us a correction of 6.4%. So we found that light will bend an extra 6.4% around the surface of the Earth past what we initially called the horizon. And what's interesting about this is that this expression does not depend on your height h. No matter what your height is, you could be at the top of a mountain or an ant, you can see around the Earth an extra 6.4%. If you've made it this far, you must have enjoyed this video, so please be sure to like and subscribe and click the bell to be notified for future physics videos. Thanks for watching.